Hello and welcome to this fifth webinar about digital ecosystem management. Uh, while uh, digital technologies are developing on a warp speed, uh, many industries like agriculture, healthcare, and energy adapt to these technologies or technology applications really slowly, or should we say too slowly. The question is why? And how can we set up an ecosystem approach to accelerate the speed of adoption? So these are the, the critical questions from this series of webinars, and we are ready um, on the, in the fifth um, webinar. So again, today we have two excellent speakers, uh, but before I introduce them to you, let me summarize a few practical arrangements. First, you, uh, you can use the chat window uh, to talk, to, to, to chat with each other, uh, but you're invited to write your questions in the Q&A window only there and not in the chat window, please. Block also your agenda for the last webinar because we have six of them. The last one is July 1st, and then we switch from healthcare to agriculture because Toby Manner from Sarvio, and Sarvio is a subsidiary from BASF. Um, Tom, to, Toby Manner will talk about Sarvio, so which is a digital platform in agriculture, and also Jürgen van Heet from Ilvo in Belgium. He will talk about the other platform, which is called DJust Connect. And DJust Connect is uh, basically a platform for farmers so that farmers have the tools to, um, and, and also let's say they yeah, can, can maneuver, can um, uh, manage, let's say their own platform, not just companies like BASF, but also farmers, let's say from the downstream parts. Um, let me now introduce the first speaker. Um, his name is Joop de Groot, and as you can already um, imagine, he comes from uh, the Netherlands. Um, he was from 2010 to 2019, a member of the board of directors from C Business. That's the corporate venturing arm from CZ, a large Dutch health insurance company. C Business participated in healthcare innovation ventures, and he founded a number of companies, a number of companies um, uh, and was also involved in various companies as a shareholder and a supervisory director. Joop has been appointed uh, since May uh, 2019 as chairman of the board of directors of CZ. And I met Joop a few years ago, no, um, already five, six years ago, I think, um, when he was still working in C business. And it was a pleasure to explore with him the different ecosystems he set up to change the market dynamics. Joop always has a strategic view on the role of digital um, innovation and ecosystem management in healthcare. It's a pleasure to have you here, Joop, in our webinar today. I don't want to lose any time. The floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you very much um, for your kind introduction. Well, perhaps to start with, because I understood a lot of people from all over the world are attending. Uh, when Wim is uh, speaking about a large Dutch um, health insurer, that's large in Dutch terms. So we're a small country with 70 million people, and large in our case means uh, market share of around 20%, 21% of the Dutch market. So it's large relatively. Um, let me explain first, and then I would like to ask you, Wim, um, to, to open the presentation uh, a bit about the, the Dutch healthcare, um, because afterwards uh, there will be a presentation in the US healthcare, and there's some big differences. In the Netherlands, we have an, an healthcare system, which is called regulated market, and actually it's highly regulated market, which is a kind of mix between social healthcare, like the one in the UK, and uh, a more market oriented like the one in the US. A social in, in, in terms that the, the basic coverage is defined by government and, all, and it's defined in functional terms. And health insurers have to follow that basic coverage package, of course. And the health insurance companies are on their own private companies, but coming from cooperations from a, uh, from a history. So they're not for profit. And, and that means it's, it's a, a bit of a, a combination where uh, the, 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 well, at least we call it the best of both worlds. And of course, uh, people from a more socialist environment says, well, perhaps we should go back to the UK. Um, but just to give you a small background, Wim, could you please open up the presentation and give me the, the second I slide? Share, I will share my screen. Right. And pull in the presentation. There you should see it already. Ah. That's good. Could you, yeah. 
I put it into. Um, so you just tell me when I have to uh, move to the next slide, okay? If you would please go to the next slide. Okay. Um, there we go. Yeah. In this slide, you'll see uh, one of our uh, two main problems. And actually, if we look at the current setting, our healthcare, and I think most Western healthcare, are actually not sustainable. Um, and that's due to two things. One is the rise in healthcare costs, and the other one is just the rise in demand uh, of, of labor force. But let's look at rise of healthcare costs. Currently in the Netherlands, around 20% of the income is spent on healthcare. And around 80% of our GDP growth in the recent years went to healthcare. And that means it suppresses other areas where we really need investments in the Netherlands, like um, energy transition, education. And actually, if you look at the global situation, with the, the rise of China, the rise in Russia, we need extra investment in defense. But actually, those investments are blocked by the upcoming, almost always increasing amount which we need for healthcare. If we go on like this, the actual spend in the Netherlands will be around 25% of our income in around 20 years from now. And it's not the absolute number that's actually making it not sustainable. It's a relative number. It's presses energy transition and the other areas. But even if cost wouldn't be our problem, even if we choose in the Netherlands to, to more or less to invest in healthcare instead of the other areas, we have an enormous other problem. Actually, if you really are out of a job and you're, you're good as a doctor or a nurse, come to the Netherlands, please do. Uh, we're a real shortage. That means some regions like the southern part, the southern west part, we have a shortage in GPs. We have a shortage in uh, nurses. And if we look at the coming years, that's actually increasing. So we don't have just, we don't have the people to even, well, produce the amount of cost I was showing you on the left side. So if you look at that, it's not sustainable. And we really need to have innovation to, to make sure that the, the amount of care we need in the coming years can be given to our patients. Could you go to the next slide, please? And at the same time, we see an, an enormous amount of apps and e-health coming up. And, and, and if you look at that in the Dutch market, for example, diabetes uh, management or uh, COPD management. And I, I think for every field of expertise, we have an, a flood of apps coming in e-health, but still our impact, our real impact is very low. And that is because due to two things, one, that still a small percentage of patients is actually offered a digital solution. And when I hear a psychologist asking at a certain time to a patient, do you want e-health or do you want a real psychologist? That's not helpful. And the other thing is, um, well, I don't think we're going to be the European champion uh, soccer this year, but we are actually the European champion in doing pilots. And, and that's rather strange. In a small country, only 17 million people, we have many pilots but what we're not doing is really going on and scaling it up and make it into a transformation in the total model of care so currently we have a lot of apps we have a lot of digitalization but it's rather blocked by the fact that we don't create transformation and that will be one of the main focus points of my presentation today next please in other industries, if we, uh, and Wim, when he did his introduction already said that, we see digitalization going uh, much faster. And that's because it starts with solving a major bottleneck from a customer's perspective, then starting out in a variable mesh, expanding to other segments, earning money. And then you see all the time that people like Amazon, Booking, um, or Apple are digitizing new services, recombine them. I think about iCloud, iMusic, for example and integrate it into new, new services, and thereby creating something like solving a major bottleneck, which we weren't currently aware of. And we see there are two things. One is that the winner takes all market, and the second thing is it creates a market shakeout. But in at least in the Netherlands, this kind of circle and this kind of upscaling, you don't see in healthcare. And one of the major factors is that it's not driven by customers. It's actually not driven by customers. It's driven by capacity-oriented and partly uh, the care suppliers. 
Could I go to the next slide, please? So if you look at transformation and why it's not working, um, I sometimes depict it as a Gordian knot where um, you can, well, try to untie it, but it's rather stuck. And, and let's go to a solution afterwards uh, before I, but let me explain something about why it's stuck. And the first thing is, well, what I explained in the previous slide, customer demands don't drive strategy in healthcare. Capacity does. What we see, for example, if we have a hospital with, um, let's say, cardiologists, and there are way too many cardiologists for the region, we don't see those cardiologists leaving. We see them seeking out new patients. And there's an infinite number of health complaints. That's the good thing about this market. But what you actually want normally, that customer will demand, well, the customer demand will drive your strategy. And if the customer demand changes, well, then, of course, also the, 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 the care providers will change their delivery strategy, for example. But in our case, still capacity is rather, well, doing the trick for these kind of companies. And then you would say, well, healthcare insurance, that's your job. That's true. But we had one thing in common in the Netherlands, or one big problem, we have a capacity shortage coming up. So they actually have a pretty strong bargaining position. And thereby, and let's see in the left uh, corner, and uh, they have a hard time reducing the, the fixed cost of, of healthcare. Um, and what they actually are doing, the moment we start reducing cost by innovation, you see that in most cases, it's not really a reducing costs. It's, it's more or less an, an, a calculation. And in order to pay for the fixed cost, they need to produce. That's our system, um, produce based. So if you start implementing new innovation where you say, okay, you can actually produce less, then some way they have to uh, reduce their fixed costs. And that's for a, 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 a hospital, for example, with a, well, say revenue, percentage of uh, uh, 1% still hard. So the, uh, the next one is that the current healthcare institutions capacity is, is, well, is almost all needed and especially, and that's typically Dutch I'm afraid, bankruptcy is completely non-acceptable. We had one last uh, year in, uh, in Amsterdam uh, that was a bit too close to our uh, government apparently and it's created a big riot. In normal market, the, the bad healthcare institutes or other um, institutes would of course go bankrupt if they don't fulfill customer demands or they're not financial viable. In our case, it means we as a health insurer are actually obliged by law to rescue them and to make sure that they get back on their track. But rescuing more or less bad healthcare institutes are only taking up cash and not, well, it's not really driving the, uh, the needed transformation. And to be honest, if we look at uh, uh, healthcare insurance in the Netherlands, we're way too focused on production and we're not focused enough on transformation. At the moment we start discussing with a care institute, these kind of Gordian knots, there's always a beautiful example why somebody from the left is right or somebody from the right is right. And in the end, you still have that Gordian knot. And um, well, I'm probably not here trying to discuss with you guys uh, the, the, the Gordian knot, but the solution. So what we're actually trying to do is changing that ecosystem. Could you go to the next slide, please, Phil? And that's what we uh, try to do is uh, take a combined approach with CZ. And that means we're trying to create that customer orientation. And at the same time, we're trying to create some kind of institutional transformation approach. And we do that by creating a special uh, product, just, and it's a digital only health insurance. And in that digital offering, it also offers its own digital services. That's, that's one part. We try to create a new base with customers, which is digital only, and um, which is e-health oriented, and thereby more or less trying to create that loop, which you saw earlier, customer focused first. But on the national level, institutional level, we try to create a transformation approach from the current hospitals, which we need, which we will probably need, and the current mental health institutes, for example. We try to do two things at the same time. One, national agreements, um, and we're trying out new care purchasing concepts. And let me go into a bit more detail 
in both of them. So our approach is a combination. Win, please. And the first one is that we actually started two years ago introducing Just. And Just was the first digital, well, really digital, native digital um, and branch in the Netherlands working for our health insurance company, purely digital. So it's aimed at digital natives, pure digital health insurance, but it also includes digital services. For example, we introduced there a skin vision, which is skin cancer check. And we create a triage question and answer service. Uh, we created digital physiotherapist. We created digital mental health. Well, actually we're there, we incorporate in our product. And we are actually coming up with full service GP and online pharmacy. So what we're trying to do for JUST is to, to make sure that the, the JUST page, JUST population are insured, have access to a wider range of e-health products. But they still have, of course, access to the, um, to the normal Dutch healthcare. And we think the moment they start using, and they're actually using it, the e-health services at first, digital first, that their number to, to really go to the normal Dutch Healthcare Institute will be lowered. The second thing what we're learning here is the way to introduce e-health services, but also what it meant, for example, for GPs. The moment we, as a healthcare insurer, are introducing e-health. This is uh, quite a debate in the Netherlands, whether or not healthcare insurers should introduce e-health services themselves. Um, it's not restricted by law. Uh, so we, we see it as a niche where we actually are trying and learning how you could create customer power to drive the digitalization. But that's only one approach. I mean, uh, could you please skip this one? I'm sorry, that was an old one. Yeah, the other one is we, we need institutional because if we only work with um, just, it's going way too slowly even if uh, uh, just is growing quite rapidly, but before it will have an enormous impact in the Dutch national healthcare system, it's way too slowly. So for the normal Dutch healthcare institutes like the, the hospitals, we are actually taking a combined approach again with one, the CZ care purchasing, but also on some national levels. And one, the first thing we did was in all e-health, in all standard contracting, uh, we integrated the e-health whether it's the GP, whether it's a physiotherapist, whether it's um, mental health, hospitals, all of them. But that was not enough. So we created a redesign program. And a redesign program was actually a program in which we, together with the hospital, uh, went to redesign the, the care processes for me metabolic health, uh, metabolic diseases like um, heart failure, COPD, etc. And that was actually, it's a quite successful program. So currently we have around 12 uh, hospitals doing a complete redesign. And the next level, and we call the sustainable coalition, is that we don't focus on the processes anymore. We focus on the hospital as a whole. And I'll come to that a bit later. So that's one thing, we do that at a CZ. And the second thing is we, um, we try to more or less use the, um, well, the, the triggers given to us, and one of them was actually COVID-19. During COVID-19, we had to make all kinds of financial arrangements in order to make sure that our hospitals and mental health institutes, et cetera, didn't go bankrupt. And as health insurers, we private health insurers, we stepped in and more or less covered the, the production not made. So we gave them the money to make sure that they actually could survive the COVID crisis. But we asked for one thing in return, and that's actually an um, acceleration of transformation. So every hospital now has to do, for example, uh, in this year, 10 new business processes and retransform them into e-health-based processes. So at the moment we have a choice more or less as, um, as health insurers, we say, of course we'll help you, but there's one condition, you start transforming and COVID-19 was therefore an excellent, well, more or less an excellent moment, but also from a system level and the hospital themselves, seeing it as a good momentum, 
because that was the first moment that patients, as well as doctors, were not coming to the hospital anymore. They had to go online. And what we did using that COVID-19 financial arrangement was actually taking that momentum and, well, created some kind of program where we um, said we want to, to stick to that momentum and actually increase it. Could we go one step further? Okay. But our most successful program, besides the, the national one, is actually a sustainable coalition. And sustainable coalition uh, was actually was aimed at not creating uh, a new business process for diabetes or for heart failure, et cetera, but trying to create and transform an hospital as a whole. But by doing that, we saw that the problems we have on the left side, not um, customer demands don't drive strategy, the, the fixed cost problem. Um, and of course, the fact that we're not focused enough on transformation, uh, we need a new concept. And in that concept, we started out with the fact that both the healthcare institution and CZ shares a responsibility for the quadruple play. So access, quality, cost, and of course, the happiness of professionals. We also said what we want to do there is increase transformation of capacity. This is one of the biggest problem we see with the hospitals that they don't have the transformation of capacity themselves. We saw a lot of innovations there. We said, yeah, beautiful, but in sustainable coalition, we create a portfolio of redesigning healthcare process every year, every year on and on. And in order to do that, the aim is transforming the complete business model of the hospital and the cost structure. So not just uh, introducing more capacity, it's changing the cost structure. This in the end, it meant, for example, in some cases, less nurses in that department. But then in order to do that, the moment you start transforming your business model, you increase, of course, your, your dependency on um, on banks, um, but also the uh, well, you, you probably have to, don't have the cash and the revenue to pay for it. So we need new innovative contracts, new innovative long-term contracts that provide the comfort to be able to reduce that fixed cost. What we saw with our hospitals, the moment we created some kind of well long-term contract where we say we know that you'll probably take a couple of years before you have to uh, in which you reduce the cost so it will help you um, transforming but also we help you with more or less the friction cost but after that period we'll see a lowered uh, cost level in total so it's a combination of giving them comfort but also enforcing the reduction and this program, Sustainable Coalition, is currently our most successful program in changing an ecosystem again. And I think we, that was uh, probably, yeah. So what we did, um, how to, to more or less solve the Gordian knot, we started out with um, creating a, a special branch just to make sure that we have a digital health insurer. Beautiful, not enough. We said we want CZ care purchasing to take one step forward. That's what we're doing, the redesign processes, not enough. So we started out with sustainable coalition and that's transforming an healthcare institute as a whole. And on the same time, we used on a national level together with other health insurers, we used the momentum of COVID-19 to actually make sure that we made a trade-off. We help you save, but then we meet, need more transformation. What a story. Thank you very much, uh, Joop. Uh, this is uh, really targeting on the, on the topics that we are uh, discussing in this webinar. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, normally we have a Q&A, but since both you and Karen, our next speaker, are focusing on the same topics, so I think it's better to move on with the, uh, with the next uh, speaker and uh, having the Q&A afterwards. But let me just shortly introduce Karen Cook. Uh, Karen, she, uh, is the, um, you, you are, you're leading the Kaiser Permanente International. And uh, Kaiser Permanente is not just the next uh, uh, health insurer company. Uh, as you will see, they have a completely different business model. And that's one, one good reason to invite you here, Karen. Uh, so Karen works to share the benefits of an integrated uh, healthcare model. So it's quite different, for instance, from the other uh, health insurance companies that we know. 
uh, and it's powered by a focus on patient-centric uh, medical excellence enabled by digital technologies. Karen designs educational programs for international health uh, healthcare leaders, providing inspiration to support change in healthcare systems around the world. She has an MBA from the Anderson School at the University of California, Los Angeles. I heard a, vis a visionary talk of Karen uh, about Kaiser Permanente a few months ago, and I'm really delighted that she wants to bring this story again during our webinar. Karen, uh, thank you for accepting this invitation. Feel free to share your screen and start the presentation. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, I am struck by uh, Yulp's presentation that while we have very different systems, we uh, have quite a few similarities in uh, the challenges of uh, the future of healthcare in, in our countries. So um, I'm what I'll do today is uh, talk a little bit about one of our core strategies, which is becoming a digital first uh, patient centered organization. And I'll say that while right now I'm focused on uh, sharing the, the highlights of an integrated care model with Kaiser Permanente International, my background at Kaiser Permanente was actually in uh, digital innovation. And so I spent uh, 10 years figuring out what does it mean to integrate uh, digital capabilities within our healthcare system. So this is a, a, a passion of mine to be speaking about this digital transformation. Uh, so Kaiser Permanente has been uh, operating for about 76 years and we are uh, a, an integrated healthcare system and our mission has been consistent for our uh, full years in operation. And that is to provide high quality, affordable healthcare services and to improve the health of our members and the communities we serve. Uh, we know that our members or our patients are healthy only if they also live in healthier communities. And so we uh, focus on environmental health and economic development and all of those uh, social determinants that impact uh, one's total health. So as Vim uh, mentioned, we are an integrated healthcare system. So the majority of the United States is, uh, operates in a uh, kind of network model and uh, operate fee for service. So what's unique about Kaiser Permanente is that we have uh, the insurance, our hospitals and our care providers all within one organization. So our members are at the center. They purchase health insurance from Kaiser Foundation Health Plan. We uh, provide care and coverage for 12.5 million members. Now that's only about 4% of the US population. So our model is not the standard in the United States. So once the health plan has, uh, you know, receives the, the premiums from our members, we have exclusive agreements with Kaiser Foundation hospitals and our Permanente medical groups. So what this means is that uh, our hospitals only treat Kaiser Permanente members, our uh, Permanente medical groups only treat Kaiser Permanente members. A few unique things about this model is our doctors are salaried. They are not fee for service. This means that it, they are uh, focused on providing the right care, not more or less. Our hospitals are cost centers. They are not revenue generators. So we're also very focused on finding the appropriate cases to be in the hospital and the right length of stay for our members. So we have 39 hospitals in our system and 724 medical offices. We have eight medical groups. So we negotiate every year budgets with eight different medical groups. And the medical groups are led by physicians and they determine what to do with that budget and how to allocate that budget to uh, salaries and care delivery. And our hospitals also get a budget every year and they, they partner 
with the medical groups to ensure that the patients have the right level of care for their conditions. And there aren't many models like us. We are the largest uh, non-government uh, integrated healthcare model uh, in the United States. And it was this model that enabled us to quickly pivot within days of COVID when we, you know, in March, 2020, when we went on um, a, a lockdown and really tried to minimize exposure, we were able to shift our virtual visits. So we increased our uh, scheduled video visits from 15% to 80% within about three days. We also, Kaiser Permanente owns its own pharmacies and we have a mail order pharmacy and we increase that uh, from 29% to 52% in one month. Our mental health visits increased to 98% virtual. And of all telehealth visits, the mental health visits continue to be in the 90% virtual. Our patients love this. The other capability we have are e-visits, which uh, have some of the functionality that I think is similar to just that you've talked about. And we conducted 4.6 million e-visits in 2020. And the e-visits are kind of a, a self-triage and sometimes diagnosis and treatment all uh, virtually. So, our COVID response was enabled by a few things. One is that we have been investing in digital capabilities for a very long time. And two, because we are an integrated model. While in the US, many uh, providers struggled with how to uh, pivot to telehealth because of the question of reimbursement, we did not have that issue. We are a prepaid model. Our members pay a monthly fee and their care is, is covered within that fee. Our incentive is to uh, prevent illness. And so for us, it made sense to address all care virtually rather than uh, delaying more care than, uh, than necessary during COVID. So, we, in the 1990s, we tried to figure out uh, an integrated medical record. We had a couple of, of failures. And in 2000, we figured out how to do a full enterprise-wide uh, electronic medical record. And that led us to uh, being able to have a My Health Manager in 2005. This is the patient-facing portal, which enables members to access their medical record. And you'll see that in 2006, they were able to see their lab results. In 2011, they were able to schedule appointments online. And I shouldn't forget in 2007, we were able to securely email your doctor. Our patients love to email their doctors. We get a lot of emails and we, we consider telehealth to include those virtual exchanges we know that patients can have their care condition addressed via an email encounter. Maybe this is three or four back and forth emails with a doctor. Well, a condition could be resolved that way. And so that is a key capability. We started video visits in 2015. They were not tremendously popular. The silver lining of COVID is that many people who were resistant, both physicians and patients, now see the real benefit of video visits. And 80% of our members who are eligible have an account with My Health Manager. We call that kp.org. You can access it via the web, you can access it via a mobile app. And in 2020, 92% of registered members logged into kp.org at least once. We have a highly engaged digital patient base 
that is using um, our the uh, their personal health record to to access care. But we need to transform the experience. And one of our key strategies is a digital first. We believe we have the data, we're an integrated system. We have insurance data, we have pharmacy data, we have medical record data. We need to be able to anticipate a member's needs and know them in their first contact with us. So there's, there's three pillars with this. We need to uh, consumerize the experience. So, you know, everyone uses Apple or Amazon. There is an expectation that we are, that we know our patients and that we are convenient and easy to use. And so how do we provide an intelligent experience uh, for our members. We also need to just accelerate the virtual experience so that the first touch with us is always digital and that we can figure out uh, the appropriate and right care and right time. That we can also create seamless transitions between all the different modes of care and that there is uh, remote health and wellness management. And finally, patients will still need to come into a facility. We cannot replace all in-person healthcare. But so how do we blend the digital experience? We have a drugstore here in the United States, Walgreens. And what they have found is that their mobile app is used mostly while people are shopping in their store. So how do you augment the digital experience to really facilitate that in-person experience? An example that we found during COVID is that uh, many, many oncology appointments can be done virtually. And this is really transformational. Most cancer care has been very much in-person, very face-to-face. But these were some of our most high risk patients. We also had the challenge of physicians needing flexibility in their schedule. Many of them had kids at home from school and benefited from being able to do virtual visits. So how do you create an experience that works for both patients and physicians? Well, it turns out that virtual works very well for the majority of oncology visits. The other thing is some visits can't be replaced by virtual, but how do you coordinate the cancer treatment so that a patient comes into one room in our medical facility and all specialists video consult in? Imaging is done from one room, but the patient only connects personally with one care provider and all others are able to virtually connect. And so there's ways that we use the digital blended with the in-person to minimize risk, make it easier for the patient so the patient doesn't have to move around the facility as much and all the care team comes to the patient. And it does help with, with burnout. It adds a little more flexibility for the care team to have virtual as an option. And so that, that's another benefit. So I'll, show you the e-visits. So the e-visits were um, one of the, the capabilities that uh, the use of them dramatically increased during COVID. This is our mobile app. You log in and you say, yes, I would um, like to uh, try an e-visit to get care for common concerns. And then you'll see that uh, the top one, of course, is COVID-19. Um, I actually just did this last week. My sons are going to summer camp and they need a COVID test before they can go. So I went on, this is actually my screen, and I click and it says, you know, I click on here. And then I can say, what comes up is it says, well, we're going to answer questions about what our need is. We're going to get a response from a clinician within two hours. And then we are in, if the 
issue cannot be resolved based on my answers to the questions. It is escalated to either a phone or video appointment. Another capability that is really, um, it, it's uh, transforming care uh, in a few ways is remote patient monitoring. And we, we have launched this in a way that we're using clinical grade devices integrated with our medical record. Our care teams get the, the real-time data from the patients and are able to intervene proactively to support our members. We've done this in a way that it's only been added when we actually have the care team and process already in place so that having the real-time data is really impactful because we can act on it and be more proactive before a condition becomes acute. So we've really launched this for diabetes and hypertension. We have also uh, we also have remote monitoring for cardiac rehab, and we now have pulse oximetry. Uh, but with, with diabetes, the patients enrolled increased by 53% during COVID. And what we've heard is that doctors feel that they are able to provide better care to patients by having this data. And patients feel one more accountable because they know their data is being observed in real time. And two, they feel that they better understand their condition and are better able to manage it. So this is having benefit of just engaging the patients more in their care. And so they're noticing the trends that when after they eat breakfast, their blood sugar spikes. Well, what does that mean? How do you change what you're eating? And so then they're able to connect with a nutritionist to speak about, okay, what could we do differently with our lifestyle to change the course of diabetes? But we're also needing, when we talk digital first, we have to look at the whole perspective. And one of the ways that we're doing this is a brand new insurance product that we launched in January in just two of our markets, in Washington state and in the Washington DC area. So the, the two coasts. Uh, and this is virtual plus. And the idea is that the primary way to get care is through uh, digital and virtual connections. So all of the virtual care is covered by premium. There is no cost, there is no copay. Uh, and then you, you start with virtual and you get referred to in-person care. But we also know that having a connection with your primary care doctor is essential. So that first primary care in-person visit is covered. This so far is only offered um, as part of a benefit with, with large employer groups. You know, the majority of US um, uh, healthcare is provided through employers. And that's true with Kaiser Permanente, the majority of our members get their healthcare through employers. And uh, so this is being offered as a, a type of plan through employer groups. So in the state of Washington, since January, we have um, over 5,000 new members in this virtual plus plan. The satisfaction is 91% uh, with this tele with all the telehealth visits. About 80% of um, healthcare encounters are virtual. We expect that will become more like 60% going forward, but to start it, it's 80%. Uh, and the, the price of the plan is 10% lower than our more traditional plans. So we actually see that this uh, is an option going forward where we actually say, digital is your first line for, for receiving your health care. One of the other services that is part of this is that you can have prescription delivery within two hours. We have mail order pharmacy, but for, for prescriptions that you need for something more urgent, that's available uh, with, with same day delivery. 
And finally, this and we have an initiative around home care. Uh, in the United States, home care is uh, fairly disjointed. It is not the best healthcare experience. And we also know that our members do not want to be in the hospital. So how do we move hospital care home? So Kaiser Permanente and Mayo Clinic have, point, have formed a joint venture and have invested in uh, a software and services platform called Medically Home. And it orchestrates the care and supplies needed to provide patient care at home. Right now, uh, based on kind of government regulations and the government um, supported health plans, only about 4% of our members are eligible for you know, covered home health. But we believe that it's more like 30% of patients could really be treated at home. So how do we shift that care at home where our patients want to be and is more cost effective? And so we're really looking at what does that take? And this model is really a test because we also have to shift the reimbursement model because providers won't get reimbursed beyond you know, that 4% of membership. And so through this alliance and these integrated systems where reimbursement, uh, you know, we're paid on a capitated model. So reimbursement, we're not fee for service. So it is worth it for us to try this and then also work with uh, the payers and regulators on what the reimbursement mechanisms are. And so this, you know, this was just announced a few weeks ago, and we really see this as uh, transforming care. Uh, you know, for us, it means that we're not building new hospitals, but we're figuring out how to provide the right care at home and supporting uh, members to have uh, the quality of life that they would like and be surrounded um, not by, uh, other patients, but by their, their family and their community and their home. So we certainly, uh, this is shaking things up. It's um, in order to do this, we, we're changing the way we operate. Uh, we, are, uh, we are designing with the customers at the center of everything we do. We're having to work differently and at the same time, we are trying to be ab um, absolutely affordable, meaning we have to drive down our costs. And that means that we have to really look at what, uh, how do we work differently and how do we deliver better care at a more reasonable cost? Because right now healthcare is unaffordable for too many Americans and we hope to have more people with health coverage because we know that improves the overall health of the community. So we see this digital transfer transformation as vital to the overall total health of not only our members, but the greater uh, footprint of where we're operating. So with that, I'll stop and uh, I think we'll move on to questions. Can you please unshare your screen? Yeah, thank you. Oh, this was a lovely uh, presentation. Thank you, uh, um, Karen. So you, you basically show that the integrated uh, insurance model uh, allows you to uh, go for rapid digitalization into the healthcare industry. And it also shows nicely how, and that's I think interesting for, for us, how um, digitalization and business models are linked to each other. Yeah, and that's also what uh, Youp has been uh, putting forward that is that you have to change the business process, you have to change the business models. But since you start with a dis different business model as an insurer, uh, it shows that you can go, go very rapidly with the adoption of digitalization. So thank you very much. So it's time for a Q&A. And while um, Ijoma is preparing, let's say, the questions from uh, the Q&A window, I will ask one question. And I think uh, let's work as a panel here. Uh, let me see if I can share the screens in a different way. I'm sorry about that. I think this is better, right? So we are now four people in the screen. 
and that makes it easier. Um, so one one question I have is, um, and I, I start with asking it to you, but feel free, Karen, if you have an answer too. Um, you 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 show you that uh, you can use your position for sure in the COVID time, right? You use your position as an insurer in financing hospitals and so on, putting some pressure on them to change, to transform, as you say it. I would like to know a little bit more about, um, because I have seen it also in other industries, what is the uh, the pressure you're putting on here? Because I cannot imagine that you could just go with the, with some hard power and just change them, right? So what what is the process? How do you um, help them changing, help them transforming? What kind of pressure you can use uh, in an efficient way? Um, well, the, 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 there are actually two things. And, uh, during a financial crisis, a, a hospital financial crisis like COVID-19, um, you have more or less a, a power bargaining chip. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 the hospital production was lowered by around 40%. So the revenue just plummeted. If we had done nothing, um, oh, around 70% of our hospitals would go bankrupt. Um, but at, at the same time, I think almost every hospital director is, is aware that they should change their business model. That transformation, digital transformation is the answer. That, that the way to go, because the, the rising costs and the shorts in labor are well known, but they need just one final push. It, it's not just about power. It, it's also about they knew that this, this was the part to go. So it was actually more or less helping them. And uh, yeah, we, we asked something in return. Um, and that's something in return, of course, isn't completely free. Uh, on the other side, if you look at sustainable coalition, for example, um, that's more or less, it always starts with an intrinsic motivation by, by the hospital directors and the medical staff, when they actually come to us and say, we want to stop with this model. The fee for service model is not helping. So it's, it's and, and that's why I'm always, at least at Friday afternoon, I'm a bit jealous of to Karen. She has a beautiful model where you, you, you don't have that discussion. It's already in there. Um, but, but what I see now is that more and more professionals and medical directors are actually coming to us, say we want in the Dutch uh, situation, we want to create an alignment between the health insurer and the hospital. Can we do that? And that's what a sustainable coalition is all about. And then you can have a foundation for transformation. Okay. Any comments on that, Karen? Because you have a different model, of different, you have a different relationship with uh, hospitals. Yeah, you know, we going forward, we still are advocating for how do we change regulations about reimbursement? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think there were emergency regulations that enabled uh, not as quickly as Kaiser, but other providers, fee for service providers, to start providing virtual visits. And this also includes phone visits. Kaiser Permanente has been providing phone visits for decades. And that is still actually the uh, most preferred type of virtual visit. And that helps some with equity issues since we struggle with access to um, internet or good data plans. So uh, you know, right now, so all of those things were covered during COVID, and we have a great interest in ha continuing that coverage uh, so that it, it becomes more uh, acceptable that virtual is the platform across the board. Because one of Kaiser Permanente's challenge is that because we're an integrated system in the U.S., people perceive a lack of choice. Because once you join Kaiser Permanente, you need to work with the Kaiser Permanente doctor. And so we always are needing to overcome that sense of lack of choice. Though I can change my Kaiser doctor at any time. And I can choose not to see my doctor if it's more convenient. Uh, today, with all this summer camp procedures, I am choosing to see a different pediatrician because it is more convenient for our summer camp schedule. Uh, though my pediatrician will see everything because we're connected. I'm seeing a doctor on her team. So there is, but that's something that I know because I'm a member 
and I've I'm part of the system, but we have to overcome that hurdle. So for us, we continue to advocate for more coverage for virtual care because it's better for healthcare overall. And it, um, as we shift to these virtual plus models, it becomes more acceptable and known by the broader uh, healthcare consumer base. Okay. Ijoma, it's time to introduce the questions on the Q&A. Please, it's your turn. Thank you, Professor Wim. Thanks, you and Karen, for your great presentations. Um, and thanks to everyone who has sent in questions today. Um, our first question is from Fabian Rizak. Um, he wants to know how important privacy protection is when it comes to creating and capturing value in healthcare ecosystems. Do you see consents and notices to be a sufficient tool for privacy protection? And a second question from Fabian as well. What do you see as the biggest issue in creating value th through AI? In your opinion, is the policy up to date with rapid technology development? Thank you. Feel free, those that uh, have an answer, please go ahead. Karen or- La Ladies first. <laughs> Uh, you know, this question makes me reflect back on a, an innovation project that I had done several years ago. And we were looking at uh, creating a digital formulary of mobile apps. And part of the work was looking at all the privacy statements and how they handled data. And it turned out that Kaiser was far more conservative about how data should be used than some of the most popular apps on the market. And so it's interesting that um, we couldn't recommend certain apps that our members were frequently using because they didn't meet our data standards, but just general consumer perspective, patients were using them, but if it came from Kaiser Permanente, the standard is different. So I'll say that um, uh, I believe that uh, over the past few years, patients have become uh, more comfortable with all these digital technologies. It's, it's rapid. And so the consents that we needed to get, you know, seven, eight years ago, it's much easier now. It's more acceptable. It's on the market. They're experiencing wearables in their personal lives. So a wearable for healthcare is, is normal. Uh, AI is essential for us and it is maybe our biggest use is in the privacy and security domain that we use AI to look at any potential breach in our network and data system. We have a 24-7 a cybersecurity hub that is monitoring any, it, any incident that would um, impact our data or networks and that is where AI is being used. And so I'll say that um, in healthcare, we at Kaiser Permanente, we have moved um, maybe a little more slowly because we are uh, very focused on privacy and security, and we are a little more conservative than um, many of our. I I would venture. I my guess is that the majority of our patients are less conservative with how they're using mobile apps and devices uh, outside of healthcare. Uh, and so we approach it um, a pretty uh, conservatively and know that uh, it, there are hurdles for vendors to work with us to meet these privacy and, and uh, security uh, thresholds. Yeah. In addition, I think, uh, um, I think uh, privacy issues are a really a big hurdle uh, if you look at the digitalization. And um, so if you don't overcome them, and it's in, in Europe, there's a GDPR, which is rather strict. It's, it's, it's not conservative. It's enormously strict compared to the US. It's actually blocking a lot of innovations. And at the same time, it's needed. Um, because what we see is patient value, of course, their privacy, especially on medical records. Uh, and there's a strange thing, as Karen also already pointed out, that on Facebook or whatever, we share almost any data. But at the same time, as healthcare providers who are asked to more or less secure the data very strictly. But the question is just, if we don't um, make people feel safe, that they won't go into digital. 
then it's not about being safe, it's about feeling safe. And that's, that's something different. Okay. We have another question from Sting Jans. Um, he wants to know, the question is to you, Yup. Um, the question is, um, you made a reference to the quadruple aim. If, however, you need to distribute your efforts due to financial and other limitations, how would you divide your means over those four aims in order of decreasing priority? In other words, if you were at the beginning of a digital healthcare system transformation, which of these four aims would probably make the most impact at the early stages of that transformation? And which probably would have the least impact in the early stages of a digital healthcare system transformation? You know, that's a good question. Um, and that's probably, it's also defined by the, 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 the field you're in at that moment. Um, for example, if we look at uh, uh, diabetes care, we don't have a shortage on diabetes nurses and, and the quality is excellent. So actually there I could choose something different than for example, dermatologists. Dermatologists has a big shortage in the Netherlands. So we could actually go for uh, capacity, accessibility instead of, well, not instead of quality, but a, a lower quality threshold and we should focus on accessibility. But the, uh, if you start with digital transformation, the fourth one, professional happiness, will probably, and in most cases, in my experience at least, will be not considered in most projects. And it's actually one of, we are introducing our own hurdles. The moment we say that the professional happiness is not part of our goals, we're creating business processes which are completely disliked by the ones who have to more or less be part of it. And if they dislike by them, they find another route. And if one thing we're good at as doctors, and especially as Dutch doctors, is finding another route. We're very good at that. So it's, it's, it's not about just prioritizing them. It's prioritizing them, look at the field you're in, solving the problem. And that means a diabetes is something different than dermatology. But one of the things you should always consider is the fourth one. If you're not making sure that medical professionals are included and have commitment to the project you're destined to fail okay. this question is for Karen um, St. Jans again wants to know how he says uh, impressive how much of a digital transformation journey KP has already gone through if you were to compare the early phase of that journey versus the phase at which you are now which of the various stakeholders will require push by KP and which stakeholder will probably actively pull KP's transformation process? Thank you. It's a, a good question and it, uh, it builds on what you've just said that I think uh, the physicians and the care teams have to be involved in the design um, and uh, they, uh, you know, we use the model of finding those early adopters in the care teams and they kind of push their colleagues along to um, provide feedback to help design the best solutions. And the pull's really coming from our consumers. We need to move more quickly uh, to respond to their demand. And I say consumers because we sell um, to uh, employers, our insurance plans, and then we have patients. So we have many different types of healthcare purchasers. And um, so we we're getting pulled and the expectation is that we can move as quickly as other uh, disciplines, other markets. And so how do we do that uh, while managing privacy and security and, and building trust? So I think trust is at the core of all of this digital transformation. So they, they trust us with their health, they trust us with their data. And our physicians also have to trust that any new technology coming in is delivering better outcomes, that it's bringing satisfaction to their lives. And so I think there's trust in every, uh, every person, every individual involved and how do we do that? And so I think that, um, you know, the pull is coming from our patients and consumers and they need to trust that everything we deliver will be um, an exceptional experience 
and that our physicians and our nurses and our pharmacists also feel that what they're being asked to do is delivering more value and not uh, contributing to their burnout. Thank you. Um, another question from Franklin Tan Chi Ping. Um, this is for you. Um, he wants to know if um, the national government subsidizes the insurance premiums for their citizens, or does insurance plans you shared have some co-payment by the government to help subsidize the insurance plan to encourage the citizens to take up the plans? That's a good question. And I rather hoped I would not have to go into detail in the <laughs> complex Dutch system, but around 50% of the, the, the premiums, uh, or not the premiums, but the, the money we need uh, are actually collected by taxes and redistributed by, by healthcare or by the government based on the customer profile we have based on the risk profile. And the other half is uh, more or less the, the premium we receive from our members. So it's, it's, it's not uh, completely subsidized, but it's, uh, it's based on the, the risk profile. And in return, we have to accept every member, potential member that, that comes to our door. That means uh, we can't select based on a risk profile. That's forbidden in the Dutch situation. The Affordable Care Act also made it so that we uh, accept all patients um, regardless of pre prior conditions. Um, so we were in similar <laughs> situation. Okay, very good. Another question from Franklin as well. Um, this is for Karen. Um, could you share more of how KP was able to convince patients that e-visits is not inferior to an actual in-person consultation. Thanks. Yeah, um, well, so one, e-visits started and uh, I remember being involved in a pilot because we like to do pilots at Kaiser Permanent Day too, a lot. Um, but we were involved with a pilot and the example was a urinary tract infection. And you are back in the day when we were at offices regularly and you had a history of them maybe, and you had symptoms, but you didn't wanna pick up a phone and have to talk to a doctor while your colleagues were around. So that was uh, the persona that we had in mind as we were thinking about this, that you could answer questions online. It matched up to your medical records. So maybe you had a history of this and you would be, uh, you would have everything taken care of without having to pick up a phone. So that was, that was the persona um, that we were going for. And it did, as we were using it, uh, it was an area uh, that people felt comfortable using. And there's also just different, um, uh, you know, the idea that healthcare becomes more convenient is really increasing. And there's a segment that will choose convenience over maybe the, the relational aspects, especially when it comes to conditions, you know, like pink eye or, or things like, uh, you know, just very common conditions um, that don't maybe require uh, a ton of uh, diagnosis or, or imaging, things like that. So um, I think that, again, it was relatively a small percentage before COVID, but, um, you know, we, we cannot let a good crisis go to waste and e-visits really were, uh, incredibly, um, useful. It prevented people from having to call, wait on hold, um, the way that our, uh, kind of our digital first transformation has happened is that when you log in to an app it'll say, what are you asking about? And based on my profile, it would say, oh, COVID vaccine or COVID test. And if you click on that, it leads you to an e-visit. Part of the way that we've uh, helped our patients become um, accepting of it is guiding them through what we believe is the best way to get care. And for COVID, e-visits were really the most effective way. You could quickly schedule that test you needed before you could travel, or you could schedule your, your vaccine appointment. And so 
uh, with e-visits, we were able to very uh, easily guide patients through the level of care they needed. And that helped with acceptance because we made it convenient. We showed that we knew uh, who they were and could uh, uh, show them to the most effective way to get care. Um, this question is from Samiha Chinag. I believe it's close to what you just answered, but I'll just ask anyway. Um, it says many healthcare systems have struggled with system-wide adoption of digital infrastructure because of low participation among healthcare providers. And even if the technological problems are solved, convincing all participants to join and commit to the ecosystem can be a critical roadblock and a key reason for ecosystem failure. How can, how can we solve that, please? Any propositions? Thank you in advance. You know, I'll, I'll use um, a few examples we have, um, especially when it comes to providers, data is, is gold. If we can provide the evidence that we are um, making an impact, that things are better, we have more chances of converting uh, skeptics. So, uh, you know, the, the cancer example of how we've shifted, um, we're doing that in conjunction with our research groups who are evaluating the process, the outcomes, and so that we have data along the way around patient satisfaction, around uh, outcomes. You, you know, one, um, uh, one other big shift we've done recently is switch the majority of our total joint replacements to outpatient surgery. So we, uh, we know that uh, recovery is better at home and we have studied that there's no adverse uh, outcomes by having patients go home the same day they have surgery and have a physical therapist be at a patient's home the, the day after surgery to help them with their rehabilitation. And this, uh, this was all uh, designed and implemented by doctors and physical therapists and home health nurses who redesigned the clinical protocol, the operational pro protocol, the patient education, and all the, the technology components to make that possible. And it was really um, by doing a pilot, having data. And so now it's, um, I think it's up to more than 70% of our total joint replacements are same day. And this has been several years, but it's really been that we continue to monitor the, monitor the data and the process and the patient satisfaction to make sure that we are um, sharing with all the care team members that this is adding value. Before we move on, I have to apologize to interrupt because you has to go to the next meeting. So you thank you a hundred times for uh, participating, for uh, giving the presentation, for helping us with these questions, answering the questions. So thank you very much. And uh, hopefully we can see Rather you welcome. In, the, in the Netherlands or in Belgium. Thank you very much. We're going to continue. See you part. next time. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, Ron, I have to go, but um, I enjoyed uh, uh, the presentation. And uh, uh, thank you very much, Karen. And thank you very much all for the, for the questions and have a lovely meeting. See you next time. A good time. Bye bye. So let, let's go for another two questions, and then I have a last question, and then I think we should normally uh, stop before eight, uh, before six thirty uh, uh, Belgium time or five thirty uh, UK time. So let's go for two more questions, and then uh, we're gonna wrap it up. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Will. Sorry. Well, somebody um, this, is from, <laughs> this is from Dees Dinko. Um, he wants to know how you see healthcare platforms evolve as you move forward and what will be the next step and how will this part be affected by the possible entries of the big tech like Google, Amazon, Apple with similar offerings? Thank you. It's a good question. And, you know, we, um, you know, Amazon is actually a a customer of ours, and they're also increasingly becoming um, 
a competitor as well. And, um, you know, for us, a platform is always the technology and the associated services. And, um, you know, we, we believe in the integrated model because any platform that provides a transactional experience is uh, connected to a, our larger ecosystem. So, um, I, you know, my sense is, is that the platforms that will be most successful have the full integrated ecosystem mm -hmm. because it gets, it's a harder experience on patients to go quickly get a virtual visit that isn't connected to their other care providers or, uh, you know, uh, pharmacy, how do you integrate that into the care providers? So I think that that will be the bigger um, shift is that it can't, it won't be individual technologies. It does have to be a platform that doesn't assume it's only technology. It, it also involves the, the people and the processes uh, around it. Isn't that the essential difference between a B2C and a B2B platform? Because you're basically in a B2B, right? So you, you, you focus on customers, but you have all the other partners. So it's not, not just a transactional platform. Yes. Yeah, I, I think so. And, um, and I think that's where uh, the, the big players have to, to be. I mean, they have to shift yeah. kind of their, their approach. Um, and the other thing is also interoperability. Uh, and uh, and the, the privacy security, you know, healthcare has a very, it's, it's a higher threshold and it, it should be, this is very personal data, but many other industries aren't subject to that. And so, um, you know, when we work with companies that had more experience in retail, it is, it's a bigger, uh, it's a bigger lift for them to uh, go through kind of healthcare uh, approach to that. Yeah, very good. Last question. Yes. Okay. Um, our last question, it will be from Swapan Ghosh. Do you see any digital transformation at the healthcare providers level like Health Cloud, where healthcare providers can exchange diagnostic images and other information with physicians and consultants? You know, It's so, it's, I think, um, well, I can imagine this happening. I think there's great benefit to it. We've tried to, uh, that's part of our um, transformation at, at Kaiser Permanente. So, um, you know, we, we actually operate in a federated model. And so we aren't, um, there's a lot of independence even between individual medical centers in different cities and individual markets, whether it be Northern and Southern California. And so um, one of the things that we've done is we have um, asked all oncologists to specialize in specific uh, cancers. And so what happens is, is that a doctor in San Francisco would consult with a doctor in, uh, you know, Los Angeles, and they're all part of Kaiser, but they're sharing the images and getting that consultation. And we're part of the same system, but there's huge benefit in that because you don't have to have all of those specialists in San Francisco. You can leverage uh, these partners. And for us, it means keeping it in our system without having to have so many specialists, but we leverage the full scale. And so, you know, whether that happens more broadly in systems that aren't connected, I'm not sure. Though I think COVID has maybe prompted some of that change. Some of what's happened is they, there is an interstate compact that uh, was formed to help uh, providers. Cause right now we have to have different um, licenses in different states, but a compact was created to allow interstate care being provided virtually. So I can see that these 
consultations, um, conferences, case conferences would could start to happen among these coalitions that that come up. Okay. So let me finish up with um, uh, a more broader question. So you, you have, of course, with Kaiser Permanente, the advantage of uh, a rapid digitalization through the business model. So, and you could move ahead, let's say, uh, compared to many other um, companies or ma many other uh, payers. Um, but if you look at the United States and eventually Europe, but probably it's easier for you to talk about the United States, what should, what should uh, who should be acting and what should happen to accelerate the digitalization, given the benefits of digitalization in healthcare, who should act and how should they act in, in accelerating, let's say, digitalization into healthcare in the United States? Uh, well, one is, you know, the, the government, they provide Medicare, which is for 65 and older, and Medicaid, which is for lower income and disabled population. And if they support digital that that takes care of a large portion of the healthcare segment you know the the people who are actually requiring the most care if they were encouraged to take advantage of digital that would make a huge impact mm -hmm. um you know i i also think it's partly um medical schools and changing the way that um that doctors are um, are trained and, you know, what is bedside manner now? And what does that look like in a virtual world? And how do you train on leveraging the, the virtual environment to provide those insights that you're, you're used to having in person? So I, I think that there's kind of the early stage um, at a part of, <laughs> of the medical system as well as uh, government. And then, you know, I, I do think there are so many tech players, essentially every digital company is a health and wellness company. They have the potential to be. And so it's really, uh, for me, it's always, you know, there's so much data, but, but how useful is the data? How would it be acted on? And so really thinking about what, what makes, uh, any information from a digital platform, what makes it actionable and supporting total health. And I think those are, are some of the, the, the key questions. You know, I don't think we've figured out how to change everyone's behavior to always be in pursuit of better health. But when that happens, that'll, <laughs> that might drive uh, the digital transformation as well. Good. So I think we can um, uh, stop it here. We can finish it there. So thank you very much for the beautiful presentation. Uh, it's a nice overview of what uh, Kaiser Permanente business model is, how it's linked to rapid digitalization and so on. Uh, thank you for the uh, Q and A. Uh, thank you for making time. In an uh, I think it's early, still early over there. <laughs> in time, uh, I apologize for uh, waking you up so early, but thank you for your time. And uh, yeah, hopefully we see each other back uh, sooner or later. Yes, thank, thank you, you so much. Bye-bye. Have a good time. Bye. Thank you. Thank you all.